we've got a special guest now who's going to be coming out on center stage, and I'd like to read something to you that has been written about our next guest. He is a serial investor who is incapable of resting on his laurels or on his piles of cash. He's dedicated to advancing revolutionary ideas that are ahead of their times, that span the world, and that sometimes straddle the fence between reality and imagination, and between fact and fiction. We don't know of many entrepreneurs who wouldn't keep a low profile for a few good years following such a widely publicized collapse of a company as happened in the case of Better Place. That is Shai Agassi, and Shai Agassi is here with us today. Please give Shai a warm round of applause. How are you doing? Welcome. Where's the clicker? There needs to be a clicker somewhere. No? I think so. Hi, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I haven't been in CBIT for, I think, almost a decade now. Um, it's good to be back, and it's good to share with you some of the insights on uh, my view, at least, as to where the, this um, phase of Industry 4.0 and how it translates into new businesses uh, will come to shape in the, uh, in the coming years. I use a title called 21st Century Utility for, for a reason. It's a bit thought-provoking uh, name. And I want to I want to share with you sort of the view of these businesses that emerged from the previous generations of revolutions that we see today, almost underlying everything we do um, in our lives. Those are utilities. We give the name utility to something that sort of is there, ever present. We don't think about it, but we know that it's guaranteed to be there. You open your uh, your tap, and water comes out. And when it doesn't, it's it's a an emergency situation, you put an asterisk on that, and you turn on the light, and there's always light, and there's el electrons just pouring through. And these were the big revolutions of the previous centuries, right? So if you think of the previous set of revolutions to let, let us to the modern life that we expect today, the molecular revolution of the uh, 18th uh, century, and, and you can see the, the change that has happened as a result of moving molecules in a better way, both in, in a sense of shaping them as well as burning them, right? So we've learned how to discover molecules in the ground and burn them. We've learned how to shape molecules in the Industrial Revolution in a better way. Then came the revolution of the electrons, and we actually learned how to transmit electrons and with them uh, power energy uh, into remote sites, and that changed our lives. It gave us more light to work with. It gave us more machines uh, that we can operate. It gave us cheaper uh, energy distribution, in a sense. Then we've learned how to send waves, and the media revolution happened. Started with radio and then moved on to TV, and, and we've learned how to move waves in really interesting ways all the way up to space and back. And then eventually we shrunk the revolution down to bits. It was just shifting some uh, storage unit from one to zero, zero to one. And if you think of how these revolutions get smaller and smaller and smaller, we started from molecules and moved to electrons and then waves, and, and last one to bits, each one of those spurned a whole set of revolutionary um, capabilities that became the platforms upon which we've built massive amounts of wealth, innovation, and in their wake, a lot of industries disappeared. If you're on the wrong side of this transformation, you're in the history books. If you're on the right side of this revolution, you're in one of the halls around you, right? So, that's the sort of the big story that happened over the last two, two and a half centuries. So what are the 21st century utilities? What's coming that is that big, that is that fundamental? And is there anything that fundamental coming ahead of us? As you look at the sort of the fundamental shifts, the flatteners, if you want to use Tom Friedman's word, there are key flatteners that are now starting to happen, and they're all results in effect of the same Moore's Law. It's the same earthquake that happened almost 50 years ago, and it's continuing to happen, continuing to give this exponential growth of power, compute, and store, um, and that is just waves coming in, hitting shore one after the other. When I graduated from high school, I had a 64K computer on my desk, right? An Apple II. 
It may age me a bit, but it will tell you that that's sort of the technology that I, I was enamored with, and that was my power. When my son graduated high school six months ago, he had a 64 gig computer in his pocket, right? So think of the transformation. When I told him the story, I asked him if he knows what 64K means, and he says, yes, yeah, this, this thing that's smaller than M. But if you think about it, it's a million times between my son and myself, and it's, it feels almost like a million miles between having a tethered computer on your desk and having one with you all day, every day. We have, everyone has at least one supercomputer in their pocket working throughout the day, tethered to a big data collection somewhere in the back. And when, when we say big data, when the Google guys came out to Silicon Valley and tried to get capital for their Google search engine, and they told the investors, we're going to store the entire internet on our computer. And people were thinking back then, it's impossible to store the entire internet. And they said, no, it's just big. It's not impossible. The answer, by the way, they got from most of the investors, who needs a fifth search engine? All right? So gives you the wisdom of venture capitalists. But the end result of what we see today are big data collections, not one, but massive collections starting off from the internet, but collecting data on information from machines, collecting data on health, collecting data on all of us, on every aspect of everything that we've, we leave behind us as footprint as we go along. But that's not enough. If you have a lot of data, you also need to have very deep learning and intelligence that actually knows how to read through all that data and find something that's valuable. What Google did, very, very simple algorithm, the ability to actually figure out what's important and what's not and rank it, actually created a whole set, a whole revolution in and of itself. And you're seeing these deep algorithms that are starting to happen now in multiple different areas. Each one is smarter than the other as far as what we consider to be smart. But you know, anything from collecting pictures and being able to categorize the elements inside of them, all the way to predicting results of elections, scores in sports, et cetera, all coming in from these deep learning algorithms. And then final, shift is the shift to affordable robotics. I mean, I, I don't know if you've seen, but there are now ro robots that you can actually purchase. They're you know, in the range of about ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000, easily trainable, being able to do all kinds of tasks, variable tasks, not dedicated machines. And you can see them through the holes around you. A lot of, of I would say, intelligent machines, not because they're intelligent, but because they're connected to intelligence in the back. Four flatteners. What are they going to do? As we start looking at the shift, we're starting to see industry after industry following these waves. And I want to go through these waves in general, but you'll see the same template repeating itself in industry after industry after industry. The first shift, the elimination of the physical store as a way to interact and sell your product. Right? It's something that we, we um, almost counterintuitive. If you think of the most successful companies today, Apple actually started its shift to a store, not away from a store. But if you're starting to see what the disruptors are doing, they're getting away from this physical presence in order to exchange my goods with you. Right? In doing so, they start collecting more and more and more data about your purchases, your presence, your taste. And eventually, just every visit you do through their experience, but also through other environments that affect you. The ability to walk away from retail operations is a very, very big shift for companies that want to disrupt. The second one, you eliminate molecules. If you're able to find a way to deliver the same service you did before, instead of molecules in electrons, waves, or bits, you're carrying into the same revolution that we've seen in the previous centuries. The third shift is actually the most interesting one. If you're able to deliver a product without an operator, in other words, if you're able to replace the people that do repetitive jobs, you're all of a sudden able to scale in ways you couldn't do before. This ability to take you from a human-operated network to an auto autonomous, automatic, and eventually intelligent 
network allows you to disrupt prices in ways that the other two waves cannot do. Why? Because if you look at costs in most companies that provide these kinds of services, you look at the cost of the molecules, they're in a range of about 15 to 20 percent. You look at the cost of the people who provide the service, 40 to 50 percent. So the ability to actually replace the operator, not the intelligent employee, not the people who make the difference, just the mundane operation of the network is very, very key. Then final stage is when you do all three, you're able to envisage a whole new set of products and your users are able to envisage a whole new way of using your own business. Now let me make this concrete. I know this has been very, very high level. So let me take you for a second through one of those transformations, which if you're in America, you've already experienced, and if not, it's coming at you right now. 10, 15 years ago, you wanted to watch a movie, you'd go to a retail store. In the, in the States, it was called Blockbuster. I don't know what's the name in your favorite town, but Blockbuster was everywhere, right? They were such a big giant that everybody figured out we're going to go to Blockbuster forever. They were such a big, unpleasant giant that if you return the product three seconds after they shut their doors, they felt comfortable enough to charge you an extra day. And if you wanted to argue, they would enjoy it. So you had a situation where the retail store was so big, the presence was so big, they thought that's their strength. A little company from my old hometown, Los Gatos, California, called Netflix, decides that the biggest disadvantage Blockbuster has is the retail presence. And they come at you and say, hey, would you like to put a list of all the movies you'd want to see? We'll send you the movies one after the other by the list one after the other. And whenever you're done with a movie, just put it in your mailbox. We don't care if it's late, it's early. Actually, it doesn't have any date. Put one in the mailbox. Tomorrow, we'll get you another one. The mailman is the retail store. As they did it, they were able to do something very interesting. They were able to aggregate all their supply into one warehouse. All the DVDs, the exact same DVDs that Blockbuster used, the exact same movies, the exact same TV programs, were now in one warehouse, and they used the mail to send it around. No change to the product, only change to the way retail was done. When that was done, they actually had a very interesting collection. It was the list of all the preferences of all of their users. And so they were able very quickly to create a vector for every user of the taste of that user. What would they like to, to see next? The next thing they did is they came up and said, hey, you know what? Can we offer you the same service without any molecules? Why do you need the DVD? Just get a box or any computer, matter of fact, as many computers as you want, as many set-top boxes as you want at home, just press a button, we'll send it to you in bits. Instead of the DVD, you get the movie to see whenever you want, as many times as you want, just click a button. That shift was so big that they eventually had to separate it from the original DVD business. Interestingly enough, when they separated it, their stock tanked and then rebounded. So the market couldn't figure out if this is good or bad. And the separation, the changes were so dramatic that the share price did this swing. If you were smart to buy in the beginning, in the middle, and hold it to the end, you made a ton of money, right? As the shift happened twice. But eventually what they had now is the ability to have a collection of all the movies on a server and just stream it to you without the storage, without the DVDs, without the molecules. The next thing they do, they eliminate the operator. So think about what you had when you came to Blockbuster. You would come in and an 18-year-old kid would tell you what's a good movie, right? And why would you trust them? Because there was nobody else to trust. It was a kid collecting the boxes and saying, oh, this is a really good movie, I saw it. Now, you didn't know if other people liked it, if people like you liked it, like-minded, you didn't know anything. You know what? They eliminated the, the operator, the small guy who actually collected the DVDs, by giving the data, the taste vector, to all the data programmers in the world and saying, we're going to give you a collection of all the movies that people had watched, we'll give you the rating that they've provided for those movies, and you write an algorithm that would tell us what they would like to watch using our data. 
and the algorithm that will be the closest to the taste of actual users will win a million dollars. And they've built the ultimate 18-year-old blockbuster clerk, the one that can predict what you will want to see. Now, when you have all these three phases, something really interesting happened. The no comparison phase kicks in. So here's where you can go to a different model. The first thing that changed, they said, why do you need to charge by the DVD? Pay us by the month, watch as much as you want. Ooh, that was really cool. Because now you can no longer compare to how many DVDs I would get at Blockbuster. I just get a Netflix account. The second thing that happened is what the consumers did. Instead of wanting to watch media in blocks of two hours, it ended up that consumers wanted to watch media in blocks of 40 minutes throughout the entire night. It's called binge watching. You start episode one of a TV series you didn't watch, and at the end of the episode one, after 42 minutes, you say, I'm going to watch just one more. And you're going to watch, you watch another 42 minutes. Now it's almost midnight. And you say, oh, it's only midnight, so I'm going to watch one more. And you watch another 42 minutes. Then it's not even one yet. You watch another 42 minutes. At 5 o'clock in the morning, you realize tomorrow is work. <laughs> but I'm one episode before the end of the season. And you watch another 42 minutes. And what you've created is a whole new taste for how to consume media. The last part of no comparison is actually the most amazing one. Anybody here who watched House of Cards? Do you know who designed House of Cards? Who created House of Cards originally? You know who at Netflix? A computer. They asked the computer that said, this is what Johnny would like to watch. They asked the computer, what TV show could we create that would have the most people wanting to watch it? And the computer came back and said, you want to watch a political drama with Kevin Spacey made by David Fincher. <laughs> I kid you not. They went to Kevin and said, here's $60 million. Can you create a political drama with David Fincher. And he said, about what? And said, we don't care. They went out, they wrote the script, they brought it back to Netflix. And they put, I, I'm sure one of you have ever done it, you send a presentation to your boss and you leave a mistake in the second page just to see if you read through the second page. They left in the script that the main actor, after five minutes, goes out and kills a dog just to see if they would catch. And they said, oh, it's a great script, go do it. And they said, what about the dog? So, oh, we, we don't have anybody to read the script. Just go do it. <laughs> they went out and they killed the dog. <laughs> Most successful TV series, not because it's a great TV show, it is, watch it if you haven't, but because it changed the way TV is done. It's changed the way TV is watched, and now what we have, if you want to think about it, is the first TV utility. You open the tap, you drink as much as you want. There's no price, and there's no end. It's the endless shelf of TV. Now, they're no longer competing with Blockbuster. They're dead. They're competing with HBO. They're competing with NBC. They're competing with TV as we know it. And if you match Netflix coming from the top, and YouTube coming from below. Here you go. The next media utility. It happened in a span of 10 years. And with it, everything changed. So now that you understand the fundamental concept, no store, no molecules, no operator, no comparison, let's look at a few other industries that are about to get hit with the same wave exactly, same template. How about cars? Anybody here from the car industry? Anybody here from the car industry willing to admit it? <laughs> no, still. No ownership. You see, we didn't buy DVDs, but we still buy cars. Well, we think that we still buy cars. Here's the reality. If you live in a mega city, and most of the world is moving to mega cities, you don't have anywhere to put the car. 
Parking is too expensive. Insurance is too expensive. When you actually got the car parking, the last thing you want to do is move it because you won't find another parking. And so eventually what happens is a very interesting phenomenon. Not only do we not own cars anymore, kids in Tokyo, kids in London, kids in New York are no longer getting a driver's license. Why bother? The average age of new driver's license in Tokyo has been moving, I think, for the last decade by a year every year. It's getting, the guys who are getting the driver's license are getting older by year every year. That's not a good sign. No ownership means the emergence of a new model. I click a button, and the guy who actually does have a car shows up and drives me somewhere. When I get out, I know exactly how much I'm going to pay him because it told me when I got on the car. It's called Uber. I know it's illegal in some places, but it's inevitable around the world. Supply, aggregation meets immediate demand, just like Netflix. Value of Uber, $40 billion. That's more than most car companies. I'll repeat, value of Uber, $40 billion, which is more than most car companies. The next wave, no molecules. There is a massive shift away from oil and into electrons, much like in any other industry where we moved away from molecules to electrons. The flag bearer for this, a company called Tesla. They made a desirable electric car. How desirable? The value of Tesla, which makes a car that has no place to even put a molecule inside, $30 billion. No molecules, just electrons. The third phenomenon is actually the biggest one. It's also the hardest one. So if you think of the earthquake happening in Moore's Law and the tsunami wave shifting and shifting and coming, it's easier to build an Uber application than it is to build a machine that drives your car. But it's just a few Moores away. How far is it? Well, you've all seen the Google car, right? Car without wheel, without driver. The Google car uses technology that's about fifty to seventy-five thousand dollars around it, around the shell of the car, to drive the car autonomously. Before the end of this decade, similar competing technologies will be sub one thousand dollars, under one thousand dollars. Technologies that will be able to drive a car. 10 times better than any driver. Now, you may not believe it, but the Google car is actually driven, give or take, a million kilometers so far. It's had only two accidents so far. The first one, it stopped at a red light, and a driver that was texting hit the car from behind. So far for safety because people are driving. The second one, it was going so fast inside the Google parking, that the attendant who was sitting there waiting for the car to break, if it breaks, got scared, pressed the button, started driving the car, and hit something. They measure not only accidents, they measure proximity to accident, close calls. Google car has 10 times less than a driver today. So if you think about it for a second, step one, no ownership, no store. Step two, no molecules, electric. Step three, no operator. What happens when you put all three together? You press a button on your application, a pod shows up, you get in, you drive across any city, average cost, same as a bus. If you're living in New York, in Frankfurt, in Berlin, in Paris, in London, and you could press a button, a car shows up, takes you from anywhere to anywhere, at a cost of a bus or a subway, would you own a car? If that car is actually there and it's driving around and it's going 7 by 24 and you're not charged by the drive, you actually get a card, you pay monthly, and it takes you from anywhere to anywhere anytime you want. Do 
you start to see the mobility utility of a city? Now, if you're not living in the city and you want to go into the city, you leave your car outside because the mayor doesn't want you to bring the car inside. You leave your car outside and you pay for the day. How much do you pay? The same as you used to pay for parking because you have to park your car. And now you have an autonomous chauffeur taking you from one place to another. That's actually better than before. How far are we from this kind of a wave? Well, the industry is arguing that we're probably at least 10 years away. Technologists are saying that technology is probably five years away. Sociologists, humanists, people studying us say we're probably 20 years away. And so I'm not going to tell you when it's going to happen. I'm going to tell you one thing. It will. It's inevitable. What will happen before? Most likely somewhere in between a pod, you step in, drive, no ownership, no car, no electrons. There will be a pod that will show up and a white gloved man would actually come out and say, oh, it's good to see you. We'll take your suitcase, put it in, sit there just so you feel comfortable. Remember, we used to have these people in elevators. Remember you used to go in an elevator and there was a guy moving a lever and he knew how to stop at the right spot? Now it's kind of funny to see an operator in an elevator. Why do we do it? We're humans. We want to see and feel comfortable. Anybody here has a, a camera on your phone? Did you got this new feature with a camera on the phone? You know when you press the button, it makes a sound? You know what that sound is? It's the shutter for the film right behind the camera. Right? It just, it's made-believe just for us. We're humans. We need the make-believe. But at the end of the day, when you get these pods moving around in the city, a lot of things happen. Usage model, just like we changed in how we view television, usage model in the city would be very different. Today, driving into a, a tight traffic city for an hour and a half is a pain in the ass. But if you have a pod, and you're in the pod, and it goes for an hour, an hour and a half, and you're quiet, and the pod surrounds you with your music, your media, your emails if you're a workaholic, it's actually the best time of your day. All of a sudden, it's not a pain. You can live outside and still be driven inside. On the other hand, if you're inside the city, all of a sudden, no noise, no smog. If you're from London, you'd appreciate it this week. And you're able to live in the middle of the city and still grow kids. Why? It's a clean city, clean air. So fundamental changes happen as a result of these kinds of shifts, and they're shifts that expand way beyond just the automotive industry. As we'll see, this shift actually expands very significantly into the retail industry. See, if there's a car that can take you from point A to point B inside a city at will, there's no reason why that car actually drives people. As a matter of fact, it will start by driving boxes. Imagine you go into your home and you say, oh, I left my shampoo away when I came into Hanover. I want my shampoo, peach, shiny hair. I have dry hair. I also want some conditioner that meets the exact same terms. And by the way, I forgot my shaver. While you're at it, I want a Starbucks with all seven decisions you need to make today in order to get a Starbucks and a snack. And you press these buttons and it shows up. In New York today, it does show up, by the way. It shows up with a, a guy on a bicycle. But if you have autonomous pods, there's no reason why you need a guy on a bicycle. The pod would actually carry it around. And for all those who say, well, how do I get it into my home? If we've built a robot that knows how to drive New York, trust me, we'll build a robot that knows how to go from the curb to the door. That's actually easier. So what happens to your habits when retail becomes immediate, infinite shelf distributed from the middle of the city? What happens to consumer goods? Do they get pre-mixed? Do they still get shipped in big boxes? Or do they get tailor-made, last-minute mix? Fundamental change in another utility consumer goods, perishable goods. And the same three industries we just talked about, media, mobility, and retail, are going to go to utility. Now look at 
not consumer spending, look at government spending. Education. How many businesses in the world would allow the board to remain in place and management to remain in place if the company had actually introduced massive amounts of technology to every employee in the company over the last 20 years and still got the same efficiency from every employee? Most companies would get acquired by a more efficient competitor. We have introduced more technology into education in the last 20 years than ever before. And still, we expect kids to finish high school at the same age, roughly with the same knowledge. We're able today to collect the intelligence, the best teachers, the best way to teach every topic broken into segments of 10 to 15 minutes from every part around the world, automatically translated into every language, and set you up with remote mentors, guides, that can take you through the issues that you need to solve. It's called MOOCs. And they're not good, but they're exponentially better every time. Now, education is going to be overhauled, turned on its head, and it has to because it's economically not feasible. Students in America today collectively have debt of one trillion dollars. That's not a sustainable industry. And yet we cannot imagine a society where people want to make 40, 50, 60 thousand dollars on the average per year, not getting them through higher education. So education is going to need to change from the ground up, from kindergarten because the kindergartners are now smarter than the teachers. And they wonder how come the materials they're using don't move when they do this, like the iPad. In the same way healthcare is gonna fundamentally change. You're gonna measure everything on you, everything you do, everything you eat, everything that comes out of you. You're gonna measure it by simply carrying a tiny device on your wrist that used to tell you the, the time, but now tells you, you're not doing so well. You're gonna get the red blinking light that you, we used to have on printers for your body. Now, when a red blinking light goes up and says, you're not doing well, and your health insurance is saying, hey, I can see the red blinking light, you're not doing well. And if you're not carrying the red blinking light, you're going to pay 10 times as much as that guy. So your insurance is going to be $500 a month if you're not carrying the red blinking light. And if you are and you're doing well, it'll be $50. All of a sudden, we'll do well. And if we can catch the top seven diseases early on, stage one, if we can catch the underlying symptoms, if we can do preventive medicine, not preventive maintenance, preventive man medicine, the cost of healthcare is going to go down. Why? Because we don't have a choice. 25% of GDP to healthcare is not sustainable. And if all this data is collected and all these robotics are around us, we will need something to run through the data and actually preserve us as a society. We'll need security. You had Snowden here. Everything will be recorded. Why? Because they can. But something will have to be built in order to protect us collectively to protect this way of life. So security will be another big utility that will be ever present. We may not like it, but we won't be able to sustain society without it. If you take these six utilities, three on a consumer side, three on a public spending side, it's a third of consumer spending and a third of public spending that will be overhauled, and you can argue with me, over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. But they will be all shifting to a very fundamentally new model. The 21st century utilities that will grow accustomed to expect as the fundamentals of our day-to-day -day life. Now, you may be happy not seeing your industry up there, or you may be happy that it's an opportunity that you're seeing up there, but Here's another interesting thing. These are all 
industries that have ancillary industries touching them. If you're not in the media, but you're in advertising, your business is going to change fundamentally. If you're in the networks and you say, oh, it's a good thing Netflix killed Blockbuster, but we have a network, <laughs> you're next. If you're making parts for cars and you're saying, well, I don't really care if they're autonomous or not autonomous. I don't really care, you know, I just make the part. Your part may be next. The industry will fundamentally change. If you're in retail and you're saying, well, nobody's going to ever not come to my supermarket. If you're looking at all these industries, if you're looking at the fundamental change they're going to go through, drug, drug delivery, discovery, think of Netflix. Think of what they've done to anybody who was on their way. Think of Kevin Spacey. You want to be Kevin Spacey. We all want to be Kevin Spacey. So, this is a template. I would suggest to suspend this belief and instead of arguing against it, figure out how to build a big boat that gets carried by these tsunami waves. Because they're coming, the earthquake has already happened long ago, and they're coming. If you have the boat that carries you on these waves, you're gonna get very, very, very far. If you're just watching from the shore saying, it's not coming, it's not coming, the future, it's staring right at you. Thank you. So, we're going to do here? We're going to do it right here. Cool. You want to sit down? You want yes. to stand? Or? Any way you want. You so, host. I mean, my Twitter account has been just going, you know, into overdrive. Um, people were asking, okay, is this the business model of your next company? I'm still in stealth. You're still in stealth? Yes. Okay. When are you going to come out of stealth? Soon. Like, can you give us a, a no. time? Okay. <laughs> Any questions for Shai? We've got, um, yeah, we've got about 20 minutes. There's got to be questions out there. Anybody out there? We've got microphones. I mean, I've got some, but I don't want to take any. Right here, this gentleman right here. This is a, uh, an interesting statistic. After every presentation, yeah, there's always a guy that asks the first question. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> But it's a funny one. I, I will say this though, before the question, you know, you're talking about um, talking about cards. I have my taxi on my phone. Um, you know, Uber was just banned again yeah, yeah. in Germany, um, and I hit my taxi in in Berlin where I live. And in two minutes, I have a taxi driver there. It's usually a Mercedes. Drive me where, wherever I need to go. I click and I pay. I never have to touch cash. I never have to touch yep. my wallet. Um, it's convenient. It, it's convenient, but it's still not as cheap as what you're saying is, is coming, though, right? If you, take a, if you take that ride in Berlin, let's say it's the average is about 10 euro, right. give or take. Of those 10 euros, seven go to the driver and the station, etc. Two go to the gas station, one goes to the car. And 150 extra goes to the, I think it's the, the taxi centrale or whatever. Yeah, so it's of the seven, I'm saying, of right. the seven, one and a half goes to the taxi, depending on the city, but right. it ends up being seven, two, and one. Right. Um, and the, the, sort of the reason is the driver is actually working the hardest, right? He's, he's working every day, all day, and right. it's, there's a great, great reason why they need to do this. Um, and again, it's over time. It's not, it's not going to be tomorrow, but 10, 15 years, you're going to see sort of an attendant instead of a driver eventually. Yeah. Um, and eventually you'll see some people opting out of a, a, you know, a car without a driver and some but people... But when you say attendant, you mean he, he will not be driving, he'll be just there to make us feel... He'll be feel. there in the beginning just to make, make us feel comfortable and you know, these algorithms are going to be 99.9% .9 and so 0.1% of the time somebody will actually need to take care of the car Yeah. and then the, the algorithm, algorithm will get to 99.99% .99 and it'll be 99.999, mm -hmm. and then eventually we won't even notice it, and it'll be, you know, once in a million miles, somebody will need to press some button remotely to us remove You're also talking about a world where we won't need car insurance anymore, right? 
it'll be, actually the insurance will go to um, the algorithms and the makers of the sort of the driving technology. Wait a minute, the, the insurance will go to the algorithm? So put it this, put it this way, Let, let's okay. look at it from a practical perspective. Okay. Mercedes is about to put out a car that has auto drive inside, yeah. right? So it's the same algorithms, but they're not gonna be used all the time, it'll be used some part of the time. And, and they'll tell you that, you know, it's your responsibility to press the button. If you press the button, you know, you're driving, but the car is driving, right? So you press the button and you're on the Autobahn and the car goes really fast and you pull out a newspaper or your smartphone, you start reading and it's pretty much driving on its own. Then it hits something. Who do you sue? The car maker, the guy who pressed the button, the, the device maker who actually made the underlying device that eventually the insurance company will need to come in and say, look, it's okay. We've, you, know, you have less odds of hitting somebody when you press the button than when you're actually driving. And so it's good for us. We are, we're carrying the insurance on this piece. And there'll be a reinsurer that will carry that piece. When that's inside a car that's sometimes driving and sometimes not driving, you're already beyond the question of whether it's insurable. Yeah. Because you've insured the moments in which the car is autonomous. So, so, so this is not then the end, and like an end game for the insurance industry at all, is what you're also saying. You're just going to replace insuring drivers, you're going to replace the drivers with the algorithm. Yes. Okay. A, a, the, insurance, the insurance industry is a very smart industry. It's the inventor of big data, right? It runs data all the time, it right. calculates what, what are the odds. It doesn't tell you what the odds are, but it sort of lets you bet against the odds, right? And yeah. they, they take the odds. And so they, they'll sit and wait until the odds are in their favor, and then they'll sort of multiply the rate by whatever factor they do, and they'll insure. Okay. Whether they insure this layer, that layer, or this layer of the industry, it doesn't really matter. They, the reinsurers take the odds on the, on the overall process, not on one event. Um, I, a great example on insurance, my, my good friend Bertrand Picard, who did the, 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 now the airplane that goes around the world, his grandfather was the first guy to actually take a, a balloon to the edge of the atmosphere, right? So he's the, he, he held the records for the highest flight at some point in time. Yeah. Swiss guy was trying to get insurance for his life and for the balloon, and nobody would insure him because everybody knew that above the clouds there's no air, he would die, right? And it was kind of obvious. And so he was sitting in the balloon and no insurance, and no insurance finding, he said, you know, to heck with it, cut the cord and went up, went in the atmosphere, came back, and then all the insurance companies came, came in and said, would you like an insurance? <laughs> You do it once, and then everybody wants to. And everybody it. wants it. All right, let's get this gentleman here with the microphone. Yeah, hi. Uh, okay, uh, to uh, how I understand this whole. Can you put the microphone to your mouth? Yeah. Okay. Uh, there you go. How I understand your template concept is uh, most of time is the delivery concept. Is what? The delivery concept. You're delivering. Yeah. So this is how I got it. So, so if you if you look at the Netflix example, yeah, only I, Netflix did you take it out. You produce something out of it. So I'll take you again to the and I think I don't, was that the question whether only delivery will change? Exactly. So so think about it the following way. Let's say you start with an autonomous car. So to get away from the Netflix example, I'll go to the the, the autonomous car. So. In the beginning, you start with a regular car, right? It's, it's a normal car, there's a guy sitting in the front, you need a wheel, you need everything else, you know, it's one and a half tons. You can even start it with, with oil, with gasoline. When you start driving it seven by 24, you realize the cost of the car is, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. The cost of gasoline for 15 years, which is the longevity of the device, is $200,000. So it makes no sense to keep it on gasoline. So you change to, away from molecules into electrons. Next thing you realize is if I can eliminate the operator and you get into an autonomous car, but then you say, well, it's kind of stupid. If it's seven by 24 and I'm lugging around one and a half tons worth of steel, can I make it lighter and smaller so I can get six cars where the car was before? Because now I don't need all this extra space and I can make it from composite materials. It costs another two, three thousand dollars, but actually I'm saving on moving the weight more than that every three, four months. And so all of a sudden, you make a very different car, right? If you look at the Mercedes car of the future, the person is no longer facing the road because they're not driving. It makes more sense to face inside, you're in a cocoon. It, you no longer need one seat, you know, you can make four, you can self-arrange self them. And eventually you don't need to make it so heavy or so big. You can shrink it down 
or make variable pods of very different size. So you're right that you start with delivery differentiation, but eventually you make a different product. Okay? Same thing as Netflix. Eventually they made a different product. It's not a movie. It's a TV series that spans over multiple years. Okay. I saw another hand right there in the middle. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I have two questions. Is that all right? If they're, if they're yeah. short and sweet, yep. Okay. Uh, the first one is probably a bit of the elephant in the room, but we all know that you are the founder of Better Place, mm -hmm. and we also know that it, of course, went bankrupt. Mm -hmm. And now Tesla, the company that you mentioned, they are currently in the phase of um, rolling out battery swapping technology in their superchargers. They recently announced that they already did that on the route between San Francisco and Los Angeles. So what are your thoughts on that? I, I I think you need to differentiate between what happened in Better Place on technology level, operations level, and business level, right? So technology-wise, we actually built a network of 40 robots, robots across Israel, 20-odd in, in Denmark. And we had 1,000 or so cars that were driving around Israel with so much autonomy that the average driver actually drove 50% more than the average gasoline cars in Israel. They spent 50% less time in stations compared to the same cars in Israel. And the stations themselves, the, the switch stations, operated six months after the company is shut down, which is quite astonishing for a device that sits on the side of the road that most of the people in the car industry said would never work. So it actually lived longer than the company. On the sales side, on the operations side, the month or two before Better Place shut down, and I was no longer there, so I don't want to take credit for what my former team had done. But the last two months, 1.5% of the cars sold in Israel were electric. In the month of shutdown, it actually moved above 2%. If you took Germany and you actually took 2%, or Europe, 2% of the cars in Europe would have been electric, that would have been called massive success. As a matter of fact, I think it's better than Tesla's rate in the US, which is their top market. On the internal side, um, I, I would dare to say we were, um, were able to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory, mostly due to internal conflict between partners, management, um, and egos. And I think that at the end of the day, um, we started doing better place for a good reason. We wanted to make the world a better place. And we ended up fighting over internal execution more so than we did on on running a better place. So you, are you saying egos got in the way of better place? I think um, conflicting financial interests between parties in the boardroom, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Did you have a second question, or was that your second question? Uh, no, that was my first one. Is okay. it all right if I ask a second one? Okay. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much, and it is most unfortunate. The other question is about the subscription model you yeah. mentioned. So. Right now, car sharing companies such as Uber or Lyft or My Taxi, they all offer payment only on the ride. Yes. So do you think that a monthly subscription model could actually prevail before the advent of autonomous cars, so where drivers will have to be paid on fixed salaries, for instance? I don't know. I don't know, I don't know the, the insides of Uber. and I'm using Uber and Lyft and so forth in generic terms. Not, I'm not referring to this company or that company. I think the world of these guys, I think they, they've run a business that has scaled amazingly and will probably live well beyond this transformation. I think they will be you know, a fundamental step in this utilities world and they will preserve a relationship with the consumer, with the passenger that will live very, very long life. They will, in a sense, hold the taste vector, if you want, for the passenger. Now, whether they are able to offer, you know, a, an all-you-can-move kind of contract. I think it's a question for, for them more than, than uh, for me. I don't know what happens in, in those stages. I can tell you one thing that um, there's no doubt in my mind that if they are able to go to that model, the cities will need to intervene with, uh, with some level of surge pricing for the roads. Right? So somebody would need to come up on top of their price and price the usage of traffic jam and it will most likely be the city, okay? I see, thank you very much, Arif Tov. Okay. 
How about over here? Thank you for the presentation. I have just one question. Do you think that the mindset of humanity will be mature enough to change considerably in the way you want, uh, you, you are uh, describing the future? Uh, because people want to own their own cars. They don't want to share their car with anybody else because this is a symbol of status. And so my, my question, do you think in this short period of time it's possible to change the mindset of humanity? So, so I, first of all, I, I put an asterisk at the bottom of my presentation that I'm not going to predict the time it's going to take. I think that's almost impossible to predict. Um, and I think you're absolutely right that, that the biggest unknown here is the question of personal taste, fear, fear of change, um, lobbies, governments, regulation. You know, and there's, there's a, I can give you 17 different reasons why things will take slower. But I can also give you 100 other reasons for why there will be a push to adopt, right? So for every reason why not, there'll be a reason why yes, right? So there's, people would want to continue to own the car. But in China last year, half a million people died of smog. And the cost of 500 million people dying of smog, of kids getting cancer in, in the womb, is so high that eventually, you know, we may want to drive, but the regulators would, want, would not want to drive. And I'm retweeting, in, in effect, Elon Musk, who said, I would like to see people continue to want to drive, but eventually governments may decide that it's not feasible, right? If you look at, at the cost, City of London um, is about to, hit, to be hit with a fine of 300 million pounds a year for smog. Now, you may argue that in China you get smog because of local production in, inside the city. There's nothing being produced inside London today that causes smog. The only thing is vans and taxis, right? So if you look at it from that perspective, you may want to drive, but eventually somebody may tell you, you know what, if you really want to drive, keep the car in your farmhouse, okay? We'll take you there, drive from there, okay? Now, does that take 20 years, 15 years, 10 years, 100 years? I can't really tell you. I know that it's inevitable for a simple reason. Just like water tends to go down to the lowest point, services tend to get to the cheapest cost. And eventually, if you're able to offer inside a city a personal experience at the cost of a shared experience, people would want it. If you're able to offer it while you're cleaning the air, eliminating noise, reducing traffic, eliminating accidents, and their social costs, the social, imagine the social cost of, of dirty air, noise, accidents, lost time to traffic. I mean, you, the, that cost is massive. And when a city says, I can offer this, and the other city can't, eventually the other city is bound to offer the same thing, right? right? So does it take 20 years? I don't know. Does it take five years? I really don't know. Will you be able to not have it? Absolutely not. Yeah. You, and your, your point about the driver's license, I, I think was interesting. I remember when I moved to Berlin 15 years ago, I remember Germans talking about how expensive it was to get a driver's license. They still talk about that. And um, I got my driver's license in the U.S. when I was 16, and I moved to Germany, and I said, I don't want to have a car, and I haven't had a car, and there's no way you can pay me to have a car. And I'm, I'm not a millennial, so I'm sure that the, the millennials and their children, they will not even think twice. I have a car. I love a car. I love the convenience that it gives me. I love the fact that I can leave my junk in the trunk. I, there's a lot of stuff. Junk in the that, that we like to do with a car. And you're right, it's, it's a symbol. I, I drive an electric car. I make a statement in doing so. But I got to tell you, you know, most people today in New York, when you ask them, how'd you get here? The answer is not Mercedes or BMW. It's Uber or Lyft. That's right. That's right. We've got uh, time for one more. I've done this side, this side. Anybody in the back with a question? Yeah. All right, this gentleman's got raising his arm or his hand here. Let's take him. Yep. 
Um, thank you, and this, uh, thank you for presenting. Very inspiring. Thank you. And um, a friend of mine uh, doing robotic uh, research, and uh, we were arguing the role of, of uh, autonomous uh, system robots, and the role of uh, they, they are saying that uh, in the future will be uh, machine to machine, and then robot to robot. And uh, would you anticipate a future of uh, no electron, no uh, no molecule, no operator, and no human? kind of uh, economy. Would that be something possible or is that, what do you think? I think it's, so I'm not afraid of the sort of the post-human society run by robots, you know, the, the dystopian end of humanity because we're not, we're useless, right? I, I don't believe in that. Um, I think that what, what we're seeing is in most societies, if you want to move, if you want to have upwards mobility in the society, you got to shift people away from the mundane jobs to the creative jobs. You got to you got to educate people, give them the tools, and then they do the creative things that robots will will never do. At the same time, robots would enable massive things um, that we can't even imagine today, um, and they will they will be critical in actually getting us there. I'll give you just one tiny example. Um, in in uh, in the U.S. over the last three four years, there's been massive discoveries of natural gas. Well, natural gas obviously came down in price from eight dollars, about two dollars in MBTU. One would think that the power supply of choice, the new power plants of choice, would be uh, natural gas. It ends up that over the last three, four years, the most common power plant installed in, in America, the most new use of, of energy, has actually been sol solar panels. Now, if you look at solar panels, in the last five years, their price, much like Moore's Law, has been decreasing sharply mostly because you're getting efficiency increase from 10% to 40% moving up. So the same guy who moved up to your rooftop and put a solar panel on your rooftop before put a device that had 10% efficiency, now has got a device that's 40% efficiency. They're not getting paid four times as much to put the panel. But eventually there'll be a robot that gets on your roof, puts the panels, moves away. When the robot is actually installing it, so today already at the prices solar panel is more competitive at your home than the power station. But when robots would actually do it, it'll be five times more competitive than today's electric utility. That robot effectively enables us to put sort of energy devices across our grid at a cost that is so cheap that it would be stupid not to do it. So when we are able to finish that robot, which is not that complicated, and install it, it changes the way we do everything, right? Did it take away from your creativity underneath the roof? No. Actually, it gives you more time, more money to do whatever it is that you want to do. So I think those are the kind of things that we're, we're overestimating robots getting into social type of things. We're underestimating how much change in the economy would happen as a result of these one-task one robots that will come into our society. Thank you. Thanks. OK. We're going to have to wrap it up, but one question before we let you go. You've mentioned Mercedes several times. Is there a joint venture between Shai Agassi and I, Mercedes I, in the works? I, 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 didn't, I don't want to pick on anybody, so I've, uh, I have a lot of appreciation for Mercedes, but sorry, we're, I'm, we're not in business with Mercedes. Okay, very I've good. I've just used Uber as a generic term. There's, no, there's nothing there. I've used you know, car makers in generic terms, not Okay, and since we haven't talked about time, do you think there'll be an announcement about a new Shia Agassi venture by, let's say, the end of the summer? I don't know. We're still in stealth. Okay, we're still in the stealth. <laughs> All right. Everybody give Shia Agassi a warm round of applause. Thank you.